Hello. It's the 4th of September, 2015, and this is episode 22, yes, 22, of the Unseen Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Carr, and joining me tonight are, from left to right on my Hangout screen, Adam Synergy Smith. Hey, everyone. James Garrison. Greetings. Mike Bowler. Hello, everyone. Nick Nielsen. Hi. And later on, we'll be joined by Mike Mongo. Now, tonight, uh, what the reason I have Nick and Mike here is they are in Philadelphia at the Starship Congress. Before we get started on that, though, I wanted to say a little bit about last week. Um, we talked about Mars One. Shortly after that episode aired, we had a comment, a very polite comment, from a, a young man named Ryan McDonald, who's a PhD candidate in the United Kingdom, who had some disagreements with us on matters of fact about Mars One. He is a Mars One astronaut candidate, and he has agreed to be on the show uh, in October. And we're going to have let him tell his side of the Mars One story. And we'll ask, we might ask him some pretty tough questions, but I think he's ready and he will bring with him possibly as many as two other Mar, uh, Mars One candidates. And we'll just hash things out. I think it'll be good. The debate uh, in the video that I posted in the show notes was enlightening only on one side. We only got, we got the MIT side was, I think, uh, quite helpful, but uh, the Mars One CEO and his uh, contractor kind of capitulated. So let's uh, let's carry on the debate here, and we'll do that in about a month. Uh, right now, the plan is October second. That that of the episode twenty seven. Uh, so anyway, um, let's talk about Starship Congress, and this is. Sponsored by Icarus Interstellar. It's at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and it's tonight, today, tonight, and tomorrow. So, Nick Nielsen, let's get your impressions. Well, the, the leaders of Starship Congress uh, had mentioned that uh, one of the reasons they chose a university for the setting of this Congress was the, the student participation of the previous Starship Congress in Dallas in 2013. And you have to say, or I have to say, that uh, that 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 was a good call because one of the uh, motifs that has come up uh, time and again so far in this first day has been student participation. Uh, we had uh, presentations from students who have created a, a Drexel University chapter of Icarus Interstellar, uh, Damian Turchi and David Evenstein. Uh, talked about the, the local student chapter and what they had accomplished. There was also uh, presentations from uh, other students and uh, uh, there after the presentations were finished uh, the, the, the to a number of tables in which uh, that was the hackathon uh, portion of the of the Congress where people got the participants and students got together to discuss particular issues in more detail. Now, what was the hackathon objective? Uh, I'm probably not the best one to explain that to you, but uh, the, the idea was because of the, the, the level of student participation of the past uh, Starship Congress to, to have a, a more intensive uh, uh, brainstorming session uh, to see, see what emerged from it in the tradition of hackathons that, that have uh, been focused on particular projects. So uh, they, there was a list of, of topics that groups could uh, discuss, including interstellar communications, direct energy conversion schemes, automated fault repair and detection, biomass recycling for starships, design of a terrarium in space. Uh, that's five items out of a 13 item list and uh, take an active role in 
brainstorming solutions to some of the crucial questions of a starfaring society. Okay. Uh, so all this is focused upon what, what's your assessment of, I mean, are we, is this one generation, two generations away from really starting to do serious engineering on this or are we, uh, what constitutes serious engineering? Uh, if you, the, the, one of the many of the local chapters of Icarus Interstellar have focused on producing fairly significant design documents. Uh, there's the, the, I, one of the ideas of Icarus Interstellar is not to, which is a descendant of the Daedalus project of the 70s, which was a, a joint. Uh, I'm sorry, Nick, we lost you there for a second. If you could repeat that last Icarus sentence. Icarus Interstellar is a, is a descendant of the Daedalus project from the 70s, which is an attempt to design a spacecraft that could reach a nearby star system, uh, which a project is very well known among in interstellar enthusiasts. And the Oh, sure. Freeman Dyson was heavily involved in that. Yes, and the, the pictures of it are all over, very distinctive craft that was the result of that. And the people who are involved in that uh, continued to design various projects, and now there are um, several different uh, potential spacecraft designs that these uh, individual chapters and groups uh, focus on in, in some surprising degree of detail. I remember from the 2013 Congress, there was one fellow there who had received his uh, doctorate uh, with a detailed study of part of the propulsion system for the Daedalus spacecraft. So I consider that fairly significant or fairly serious engineering, as it were. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm kind of stuck in the NASA paradigm a little bit with phase A, phase B, uh, all that. But uh, let's, let's uh, put it in terms of observables, uh, the planning, at least, of, of Various prototype tests would be kind of where I would start it. Well, the you both of the organizations I know of that have been involved in uh, interstellar advocacy, uh, Icarus Interstellar and Hundred Year Starship, have have focused on a uh, hundred years as a time frame for launching an interstellar. Uh, mission so if you count a generation as 30 years you're about you know three generations from a launch and if you count it as 25 years you're four generations from a launch right uh generation is now about 30 years uh, uh, uh i have a friend who works on the birth certificate indeed uh so anyway um okay so that that's that's fair i mean i mean launch is is very far down the road from what Prototyping. I Prototyping. Yeah, uh, very far. But, uh, you know, uh, and one of the things I want to discuss, not tonight, but sometime in the near future, has been the idea of sending ultralight interstellar probes, uh, but very low mass, uh, which is a SETI talk that we presented. I invite you all to watch. But it's full of Really interesting ideas. So, but anyway, I don't want to get too too uh, diverged on that. Uh, now, Buck Field just showed up and then disappeared. Uh, so, Buck, if you're watching, uh, come back in. <laughs> uh, Buck's also in Philadelphia. So, I haven't seen him if he's here. <laughs> you haven't seen him? Well, I understand he's in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, Mike Mongo, as you guys know, is is also there, uh, but he was uh, being his usually socially active self. He had some interesting people on the table around him, so it, maybe we'll see Mike a little bit. Uh, so, uh, what's what's the what's on the schedule for tomorrow, Nick? Uh, well, in part, I'm on the schedule for tomorrow, but uh, the the main the, the main superstar of the day tomorrow will be Ralph McNutt, who will give a keynote address on next steps, the stars after Voyagers and New Horizons, and uh, Dr. McNutt was uh, involved uh, in centrally in the planning of the New Horizons mission. 
so he'll be there, and there will be several other um, several other participants will uh, will be delivering on the theme "Our World in the Interstellar Area Era: Civilization and Culture." Yeah, I actually know Ralph McNutt from his uh, days as member of the science team on Messenger. The, the mission that went to Mercury. So he was a key member of that team um, as well. Yeah, we're looking forward to his address tomorrow. Yeah, he's a good guy. Uh, and uh, he's been working on some variant of interstellar flight for a long time. Kind of, a, kind of an unfunded uh, <laughs> unfunded interest of his. Uh, Buck Field is here. Buck. You unmute your mic and say hello. Hello, everyone. Okay, good. I'm glad oh, that's working for you. Now, Buck, what, what uh, Nick just told her to, about his first day at Georgia Congress. Why don't you tell us about yours? Well, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it. I'm oh. still in Patagonia. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's, I ju- okay. I actually just done. Back All right. <laughs> so I've been I've been traveling uh, and and just got home uh, two days ago. Oh, extended trips to the states. I went to Easter Island um, and around. Oh, okay. So uh, I've been following the uh, Starship Congress remotely on the live stream oh. and and uh, via their updates on the website. Can you tell us what your impressions are so far? Well, I'm really sorry that I'm missing uh, Nick's presentation because um, I'm becoming quite his fan. Okay. Well, uh, anything else? Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, I was really impressed by the uh, first presentation by the students. Um, the discussion of their uh, uh, fusion engineering project was uh, 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 remarkably mature and well-developed, in my opinion. Um, the idea, the main claim of... Uh, uh, I, uh, is it Turchi? Tucci? Uh, what's it? Yes. Uh, let's Turchi. Turchi. Um, he pointed out the need for numbers and, uh, uh, generating a broad, uh, community of support, which I think it was key and, uh, and very forward looking. Um, I'm sorry I missed, um, Rachel Armstrong's presentation. She's uh, usually a very good speaker. Uh, Nick, did you mention that? Well, I, I hadn't gotten into it in any detail, but yes, she get it. She she gave a wonderful presentation. She was the opening keynote mm-hmm. after being introduced by Andreas. She normally focuses on uh, some very interesting uh, architecture and uh, living features, but it looked like this presentation was a uh, different perspective. It was interesting that she focused on a uh, uh, a, a, a critique of uh, what she called the interstellar question from uh, a member of the Oxford Future of Humanity Institute. I'm not familiar with the particular critique. I'm going to look it up, but I think she said it was by Nick Beckstad, uh, who laid out some of the potential problems of an interstellar uh, uh, mission and... Uh, uh, Dr. Armstrong uh, reflected on the uh, irony of someone from the Future of Humanity Institute um, essentially not being on board with that aspect of the future that involves uh, star flight, which I also find a bit odd, but I guess not surprising. Uh, there's room for all viewpoints, and there are many people who feel that the the, the starship community uh, space travel community is insufficiently self-critical and everybody is, which isn't true, and people critique each other's ideas all the time, but perhaps to an outsider, it, it looks like a lot of um, uh, uh, upbeat talk without anybody internally uh, questioning some of the ideas. Uh, I don't Yeah, well, I will, I will take you up on that because I am going to critique your idea that there's room for all uh, opinions and viewpoints. And I think some viewpoints are stupid and uninformed and counterproductive and I'm against those. So I don't want to make any room for that stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, they well, can go is, elsewhere. Yeah, but <laughs> there is an uninformed viewpoint, but the the kind that the 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 critique that Rachel Armstrong was critiquing wasn't stupid or uninformed, but it was, uh, um, uh, no, in no, my no. opinion, mistaken. Yeah. There, you know, the, the, everybody knows that there are people who are, you know, intelligent critics. You really have to take account of, and unintelligent critics who may safely be ignored. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, yep. And and it's it's often a judgment call about who, whom to ignore. You could be yes. wrong. <laughs> we all yes, have biases. Yes. And and the Future of Energy Institute is generally does very well thought out work, uh, which is. Almost all probably wrong. Uh, be- <laughs> not 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 because they're not smart people, but because what they're trying to do is is extremely difficult. Hmm. Uh, well, one thing that Dr. Armstrong started out the- with, and it's often the focus of, of talk at Starship conventions, is uh, the the difficulty of being taken seriously as an academically rigorous study. And uh, there, you know, everybody who's in, interested in the in the particular aspect of the future that involves space flight knows the the giggle factor. And she talked about coming through U.S. customs and being questioned about, you know, why she was coming to the U.S. and what why if she was going what what she was going to give a talk on and whether or not she should be honest about she was going to get a, give a talk on prototyping starships or not. And <laughs> I'm, a lot of people probably feel similarly. About whether probably they probably just should have said space honest. flight. And I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a question of, of do, whether you want to finesse it or not, or whether you want to be straight up and say, yeah, I'm driving to Philadelphia to talk about starships. Hmm. Sometimes that, that can be a, a conversation stopper, unfortunately, for those who there's the giggle factor, and then there's the not being taken seriously, and uh, all the other things that go along with the visionary project. Well, yeah, I mean, to me, uh, you have to be visionary, and you have to look at the long term, but you have to recognize that you're probably going to be wrong, and that you know the the way the way we're going to make progress is by being wrong in a testable, verifiable way, and then going out and finding out how we're wrong, and then moving on to the next thing. Uh, it, it's there, you know there is such a thing as unverifiable speculation uh, is not really going to take us forward but uh, but there are there are untestable and unverifiable ideas that are that are not the same as speculation and i would i would argue and in fact i will partially argue tomorrow that 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 uh, some of the the philosophical ideas that underlie civilization you can't really say they're right or wrong, but they do motivate particular courses of action or frustrate particular courses of action. Mm-hmm. It sounds like ideas, you're talking a little bit about pragmatism. And for example, chemistry came out of like, if you want to go back to the roots of pretty much any science, they call this the genetic fallacy where you attack something because of its roots and almost any uh, admirable paradigm of science that we can choose uh, started with pretty disreputable inquiries by today's standards. That's true, but that's not what I was talking about. What I'm talking about are the the overall uh, themes that 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 motivate a civilization. Now, it, it's very often uh, mentioned when people talk about very long term projects. Uh, Egyptian civilization built pyramids, and uh, medieval Europe covered itself with enormous cathedrals for hundreds of years where there are long multi-generational projects that are primarily motivated by uh, an overall outlook of uh, on life a philosophical point of view and a religious point of view that motivates these undertakings that are that are mere artifacts of the ideas as it were right well i mean there's always going to be i I don't know if at some point there's there's a value judgment right which is not not There's always a value judgment, I which think. is not verifiable. Uh, it's, but it, it comes from experience, but it doesn't. Uh, it, it's really just your own uh, sort of the human heart saying, "This is how we should live. This is who we are. This is what what we do." And uh, that will vary from person to person, from civilization to civilization. 
and uh, it it can fade and, and wane. I mean, look at how the Chinese, how well the Chinese were doing back in medieval times, until they decided that they preferred the comforts of home more, and they could have probably conquered the world. They chose not to. So, you know the the. Uh, at, at each and we've had we had a failure of nerve in the 1970s at the, the United States. We were so beat up by Vietnam and Watergate and uh, the Cold War that we just gave up on space. Essentially, yes, I would agree with that. But we said let's let's just circle the planet hundreds of times and call that space exploration. And you know. Of course, uh, the program we had then was sold us much more than that, but that was how it was sold. It wasn't really what it was. And I remember 1980 feeling very excited about the shuttle thing because I had bought all the hype that it was going to get us to the moon and Mars. Cut launch cost to $500 a pound. And, but I was, a, I was a young guy. I didn't know what I was talking You know, I didn't know how that... that uh, that was true or not. Uh, Mike Mongo, are you there? No, he's not. Okay. I'm trying to get Mike in. Um, Can I just interject for a moment? Sure. Uh, going back to testable science, testable proposition, there's an instrument called the White Jude uh, Warp Field Interferometer that uh, I think there was a some sort of uh, test bed for it at uh, JSC Earthworks. Uh, have you had any sort of update on that? Because that's been around for, what, two or three years now? The idea of trying to create a microscopic uh, warp bubble. Uh, Is there any- no, I haven't heard of that. I mean, I've heard some stuff that I thought was complete. Uh, to use one of your uh, <laughs> phrases, <laughs> bollocks. Uh, <laughs> I, I just uh, wondered if there, there was anything coming up at this conference about that because I haven't heard anything recently about it. Yeah, no. it doesn't seem that, that that Harold White is going to be around for that. He he presented at the 2013 Starship Congress, and he is actively involved in research surrounding the Alcubierre drive and related concepts uh, that are a workaround for uh, and sometimes called, you know, warp drive, if you like. But I don't, there hasn't been much discussion of that on the first day, and uh, I don't see him scheduled for the second day, so I, I'm not expecting any imminent updates on that. Yeah, uh, I would refer anybody who's interested in that to uh, Ben Tippett, who has a really good episode of his titanium physicist on that. Um, the uh, Or Alcubierre himself has said that uh, he doesn't think it's going to work, but uh, it, the thing is, we don't have the ability to create even at a very small level uh, the kind of energy densities that that could be measurable. So, um, I'm we'd have to get hold of some very exotic matter. Well, even if you had the very exotic matter, you would need a lot of it. Uh, yeah. So it it's uh it's very far from uh even a, t- a testable proposition. But, uh, you know, and, and as Ben pointed out, you would need, uh, if you had one, if you had a warp drive, you could time travel as well. There would be uh, all kinds of things going on. So I think we know, well, I shouldn't say no, I think we have pretty strong indication that it's not easy to do. No, uh, we'd have time traveling visitors, wouldn't we? Time travelers, we'd have space travelers, we'd have, this is some, one point that, uh, Jeff Landis put to me, he said, if if it was possible, if interstellar flight was easy, we'd see a lot more evidence of it. And, you know, so uh, it's not easy. We know that. I, well, I shouldn't say, again, I'm, I'm being too dogmatic. I'm saying we, we have, we strongly suspect it's not easy. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't think we need to add any qualifications. 
it's, it, it's, it's not going to be easy. And so when you say it is not easy, it, it, it implies that's one of the main responses to the Fermi paradox. You know, I think, why aren't we seeing any? I think it's the only great filter the that universe. probably that that we know is for sure. <laughs> that we know we know it's really really hard to travel between the stars. Uh, yeah, I, do, I was going to say I do have a question for Nick right quick. I don't know if you guys can see on the screen the image of that ship. I yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and that's that's their design that they're kind of playing with right now on the interstellar ships. That, yeah, I, that's, I was just uh, uh, well, that, that's, uh, that's Rademacher's design, I believe. Yeah, I was just looking at that and thinking it was very kind of Star Trek influenced. Yeah, it's it, almost like a bird of prey. <laughs> <laughs> that that is, image has been yeah. used very widely, that's, and that, I think... Uh, I think Buck is right that that's Mark Rademacher's idea. It's not necessarily the starship most people are uh, are, are 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 working on. The teams who presented today uh, did yeah. not their their designs don't reflect that at all. Well, you know, I've done a lot of conceptual designs of spacecraft, uh, and the first the first cartoon you show your customers almost certainly not what's going to end up looking like. Uh, I mean, and th- those are well, those are fairly mature technologies, so uh, you know, don't. No, I, I, I'll go ahead, Paul. Sorry. So, so I mean, I, uh, I wouldn't be I would take any cartoon literally. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I mean, just so, most uh, people who are actively working on starship designs today, and who are involved in Icarus Interstellar, they they are interested in using what is customarily referred to as near future technology so Mm -hmm. they're they're looking at things like inertial confinement uh, fusion drives which is the basis of the idea of the daedalus project and many of these are variations on that theme Uh, we had a good presentation today on the um let me see if i got it in my notes here uh plasma jet magneto inter inertial fusion PJMIF. Uh, that was from the uh, Drexel University chapter uh, address given by David Evenstein, uh, and that that was the theme of a lot of a lot of the designs. It's not when you get it's not until you get to the people who are working on exotic propulsion ideas like the Alcubierre drive or uh, wormholes or things like that, and nobody's even mentioned Q thrusters here. So. Uh, there's even though there are a lot of ideas going on, it, it's not exhaustive by any matter of me. What, what's a Q thruster? Sorry, I, what's a Q thruster? Quantum thruster, I think. Uh, I, I've looked up, yeah, I believe that's it. Uh, I'd have to, I'd have to read quantum up on it. Thruster. Okay. Yeah, I think this is uh, people who want to mine the quantum vacuum because as you get smaller and smaller wavelengths, the energy goes up, and there's this zero point energy idea that if you can harness wavelengths that are small enough, you have access to. Uh, sort of like the energy of the space-time continuum itself. Yeah, but we know be, that's wrong, right? Because I mean, it's 120 orders of magnitude off, at least. So, well, uh, it's probably slightly more likely than prayer to get us to other stars. <laughs> well, only slightly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But it has that veneer of scientific uh, techno babble. There's, that, there's that, an awful that, lot know, of really makes it quantum up. quackery out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, do I need to bring Chopra back? No, no. Let, let's let's uh, <laughs> let's not beat that dead horse anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, until he, well, until he says something else, stupid. <laughs> one thing I was going to say about the designs: uh, pretty much any time I've ever seen any kind of a design on the, sh- the superstructure of any kind of an interstellar ship, it's always been sleek it's always been sexy you know eye-catching and attractive and then you know going back to the star trek example then you have the borg which is just a massive cube nothing attractive but just pure functionality if we do design these kinds of interstellar vehicles do you think it's going to be more of they design each of the parts and then put them together and build the ship around that 
to where it's not as sleek and attractive. Well, you're you're going to need something to protect you from the interstellar medium, which is probably going to be uh, kind of pointy looking. Uh, mm-hmm. But, Indeed, one, uh, of the, one of the one of the designs shown today was pointy looking, and those who presented it said, "Ah, I know everybody says you don't need uh, uh, to be streamlined in space, but it, it works better to deflect the interstellar dust if you if you make it." Yeah, if you get much over one percent of the speed of, well, actually, even one percent of the speed of light is too fast. Uh, you start getting into serious problems with the interstellar medium. Uh, so uh, it's. Yeah, you have to do something about that. Uh, yeah, I, I I take a very different view on something like that because to me, um, I I tend to look at that as a resource. Um, you have highly, relatively speaking, you have an impact of very energetic particles, which to me is a potential energy source, not necessarily as a, a Bassard ramjet, but it is something that and. and and here's the here's my basic view on space travel is that the most rare thing in space is stuff and energetic stuff is what you need in space and if you're moving fast you've got that but um to me i i i feel like crossing the interstellar medium is um kind of like crossing the ocean if we can avoid it it's probably better like in to use the uh, you know centuries old example, flying over the ocean is generally better and uh, safer than going across the ocean. And I think until we figure out uh, what space time is, which I tend to think is likely to be an observational consequence of the kind of creatures we are, um, then I I don't think that uh, like these relativistic ships are. Uh, I think they're good for in-system engineering, but actually designing like the the streamlined shapes we like because they're sexy. The Borg cubes convey the pragmatic concerns of sheer practicality. Um, but until we know exactly what sort of thing can actually get us from point A to point B without crossing the intervening distance, and I don't think much of like these wormholes and bending space time since we don't really know what it is. We know that our perceptions of it seem to um, seem to very clearly correspond to curvature, but our course, you know, our observations, we can make very accurate observations of the motion of the sun, but it isn't really moving. It's an observational consequence of the type of creatures we are species in biology. Wait a minute, did you just say the sun isn't moving? Well, I'm saying that the, not the celestial, the daily celestial motion of the sun and stars, we can get very accurate measurements of these. Yes. For example, in the, it, you know, back, it, the Egyptians did this. They mm-hmm. made very detailed observations of this, and they were predictively accurate, all the great virtues of modern science, but they were measuring something that wasn't actually real. So naturalists, uh, starting like, let's say, with Linnaeus, when he was categorizing these uh, very separate, individually created species uh, that were pre-Darwinian, so going from pre-Copernican Egyptian cosmology to pre-Darwinian revolution uh, biology, these things that we can measure and catalog and make uh, very accurate theories and accurately predictive theories about um, – during scientific revolutions, these things change, and they turn out to be observational consequences of the kinds of inquiries we make and the uh, nature of our paradigms with regard to reality. And I think that it's very but clear. But I heard you say, I mean, I know about the paradigm stuff. I heard mm-hmm. you say the sun isn't moving. Is that what I heard you say? The sun isn't moving relative to the kind of measurements that we would make in terms of like how it comes up every day, how it comes over the horizon. We can predict this sunrise. We say the sun rises. Sunrise is at X time. Now we know that that's not a real motion. It's an apparent motion due to our 
rotation on the surface of the Earth. That's what I'm referring to. I'm, I'm not talking uh, about its its orbit within the galactic disk or the motion of the galaxy. Yeah, but I understand that. Because now, I understand. But it is moving about the very center of the solar system. We can, we can make new observations that are consistent with all previous observations, but we show us more accurately what's going on in the solar system. If we were to ascend over the plane of our solar system and we could see the sun in relation to the galaxy and, this, uh, and the planets in relation to the sun, we could see why we are getting these abs uh, observation selection effects. And we could see it with you know, essentially the same sensory endowment we have at present. It's just a matter of our position. Well, our, our relative position, but the thing that I'm concerned with is not so much these uh, things external to us. I'm concerned with how we adequately or most uh, optimally allocate our research uh, resources, our available resources um, in research if we expect something to produce a, re a uh, revolutionary cognitive change. And in physics, given especially given fundamental physics um, confusion, there's a whole there's a whole plethora of theories out there. And when you take when you go to these conferences, they've gone and taken um, uh, surveys of the attendees in terms of what interpretation, for example, of quantum mechanics do they favor. And there's a couple of blog posts. Uh, uh, I think uh, I think scandal was one of the terms used for the lack of agreement on what space time or what basically reality is and what interpretation of physics theories should be um, most uh, most accepted in terms of accurately reflecting the truth about reality. This is the sort of situation that historically has led to a transformative paradigm change. And we're, we're seeking this, except the people who study paradigm change over history are in philosophy departments. They're not in physics departments. And so uh, I don't think the research community is being well informed in terms of uh, where to look for clues about how to reformulate uh, physics into a consistent model everyone can get on board with. So you're, you're saying that essentially we need to understand the nature of space-time, the nature of reality, have a better understanding yes, of uh, quantum gravity, dark energy. We need to understand dark matter before we can start to travel across the galaxy. Is that what you're saying? I, I would say that, although I would put a priority on understanding the nature and limits of our inquiries into natural phenomena and how our approaches have risks of making huge mistakes that we should be on the lookout for. And yeah. this is something that you don't learn in physics. I want to come back to that book, but uh, I'd just like to say hello, Mike Mongo. Definitely. And, and friends. I, I Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear us? Okay, so here I, it's, I, I'm here. Rachel with and Andreas. Dr. Rachel Armstrong and uh, Dr. Andreas Tiziolas, president of Icarus Interstellar. Yeah, well, Andreas was on uh, in episode 12. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Rachel is a... Pretty, pretty well well known world ship architect, and uh, and you can introduce yourself, Rachel. Yeah. Yes, um, um, <laughs> I'm a professor of experimental architecture at Newcastle University, and um, I work on um, a project for Icarus Interstellar called Persephone, which is about the design and construction of a living interior, starting with the construction of its soils. And you guys, we've been we've been doing Starship Congress since seven o'clock this morning, and so it's like. <laughs> we're, we're, we've eked out a little bit of energy for the, for the okay well you know i think people often uh are more candid when they're a little bit tired uh, <laughs> ah here we go good question so, so tell me how your day's gone uh, been, any of you can start it's been phenomenal i mean it's been a great day i mean it, what, what with this year at starship congress 2015 is an interstellar hackathon and what and and uh we really we kind of played it loose and casual and and Andrea set up the structure of the event this afternoon after the academic portion of Starship Congress, where, where uh, uh, I guess about uh, eight presentations were done during the day. And then uh, after that, then we, all the all the attendees and presenters got together 
in a, a atrium, large atrium, and we broke into individual groups as after beginning being giving a, a sort of task, and it was to to self group, self organize around specific ideas, and and people just vocalize the ideas that they were interested in working on, and then people gravitated towards the towards their subject of interest, and uh, Rachel came up with this idea today that it was it was, it was really simply it's paraphrased as a it's no it's specifically what is a starship it's an idea that we take for granted what a starship is and when you when a lot of times we take for granted why a starship but when you think about what a starship is i mean if you want to elaborate feel free to I, I guess our definitions are really framed around an assumption that we're a modern society um, and uh, um, that our challenges are all solved by the um, a development of advanced technologies. But that's not the only way of looking at the interstellar question, the interstellar question being, um, you know, will humans one day um, ever live amongst the stars? And we've looked at the interstellar question from a number of different perspectives throughout time, you know, so we could look at it from a religious perspective where we see ourselves in the stars amongst, you know, in, in, in the afterlife. Um, we could think of it in a magical kind of way. And we're in this high tech age. But we also assume that we're going to project um, a fundamentally industrial culture um, out into the screen that we call space. And then, then that's going to be the way that we're going to live. And so really what we were trying to do is to look at the, the, the philosophies, the ways of understanding um, uh, why we're going to go into space and then think about what the starship as um, an embodiment of that actually represents. So, for example, um, if we place humans right at the center of everything and we take an anthropocentric view, the spaceship becomes a, a vessel for transportation. However, if we take an ecological view, we can actually start to think of the spaceship as actually changing environment as it passes through it. So, for example, it can draw together um, uh, traces of matter as it moves through an environment to create, let's call it, plane trails or little starship trails that become sites for new creation of other kinds of events. Um, so, you know, in some ways, we are raising the threshold of um, uh, connectivity. Um, in, in, in other ways as we move around the universe. So, I mean, it's just, just a way of thinking about what it is that we do. Um, you know, once we start to think about designing one of these instruments, are we discovering, are we, are we catalyzing things, you know, or are we just in a, in, in a sealed vessel, I mean, being fired from a cannon, as it were, over to Alpha Centauri or wherever we go. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to tell me what they've learned today? <laughs> I know. I mean, that, that, those ideas are really, really important. I mean, when you think about what is a, a starship, you, you, you have to you have to really think about what is the purpose of a starship. And what we came up with is that, and all these different groups broken broken. Into, uh, excuse me, all these different all these individuals broken into different groups, and they each had their own. There was a lot of engineering questions, and then there were other. There was a political group or a philosophical group. There was a gaming group, and our group was. I don't, I don't know what we classify it but, but when but just defining what is a starship we came up with three ideas why people we, why humankind would use a starship in the first place one of them was colonization like that's sort of the the mind think of the day the, the traditional okay let's go out and we can build stuff here and we can mine the diamonds from the asteroids we can uh, find other species of, of life in, on in other in other solar systems and open up lines of trade we can uh, uh, rebuild humankind so that we can, I mean, like foster the, the next coming of the Roman Empire. In a sense, that's sort of like that's the, the idea of the day. It's all economic based and, and uh, uh, this uh, rule of scarcity. That's the first one. The second one is it has to do with what Rachel was talking about. And, and that is um, make, make what, what the second one was the uh, oh, agents of change. Yes, agents of change. Ages of change, and that would be using uh, that would be utilizing a starship as a as a almost as a as a uh, uh, and and so we would become sort of uh, intergalactic artists just by just by going through and thinking of our role as a participant in the developmental the the developing of the galaxy of of being allowed 
to go through and make changes that would foster life or foster it could be that could lead to terraforming ideas but you could you can go in different directions with that but that's a real one i mean just by participating by going out and doing space traveling by doing space exploration we 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 all know that we make changes when when people like at nasa talk about what happens when you send a spaceship to mars and it's got microbes on it and then because of the uh, this is the, the 1967 treaty on uh, it's outer space treaty. the outer space treaty like people are like oh you're not allowed to touch anything you can't do anything you can't you, you cannot do those things well there's a whole segment of the population that thinks that, that we should be doing those things not that it's our obligation but that it's good to do those things so that would be the second one agent of change and there's a third one the third one is that is uh oh and, and stopping itself from going to entry. I don't know if you've ever heard um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about that we are all just, just we are stars being aware of themselves. Life, life is a stop. We are cre all created by stars. And so as a, for whatever reason, stars wanted to be aware of the universe in a sense. And that's how we, we became manifest. So the third one is, is, is just, it's almost like a, um, what's the word when you don't have um, free will? You're, let's, Predestination. Yeah, and, and it's deterministic. Yeah, it's, it's a, the, the universe, we are here just so that stars are, are understand itself. We, that, so that, that the universe can, can perceive itself. That's why life exists. So those are three different takes on why you would have a starship. The first one's colonization. The second one is the agent of change. And the third one is so the universe can be better aware of itself. Those are three very, very clear ideas and, and definitely play into a lot of people's understanding or thinking on what, what is the purpose of a, of a starship. And that's important because we sort of move past the question of why starships. We get that. Everybody gets that. If you don't get that, then you're, you're playing at a different, different level of gameplay. It's like that. It's like the that the the monkey that stays up in the tree is like. There's a conversation with monkeys. I'm going to go down on the ground, and the other monkey's <laughs> like, "No, I'm staying up in the tree." And that monkey stayed up in the tree, and now it's in the zoo. And here we are in the future, and we've developed into a civilization. We have cable television and smartphones and all this stuff. Well, now that opportunity. I mean, I'm being flippant in a way, but now that, that opportunity has has come about for us to make another decision. Do we want to? be a terrestrial species or or are we going to go beyond that are we going to go out into space and that second choice may be that evolutionary decision now the the difference between the the monkey analogy i made earlier and where we are right now is that that monkey or that 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 time and that occasion when these small decisions led to bigger impacts it, we weren't conscious of that we weren't thinking we weren't really like, no, I'm going to move down out of the trees and get smartphones. That wasn't what was going through our head. But here in the future where we are evolved human beings and we, under, we comprehend the idea of evolution, we, we, uh, we now know that's a thing, most of us, uh, many of us, then we can, if, if there's an implication. And that is that we can, we can decide on where we want to evolve to. And that is, and when, when you get past that place in the why of a starship, then you start to think, well, what is a starship? You really have to put thought into that. And that was what Rachel came up and brought today at Interstellar, at Interstellar, mm -hmm. at the, in, uh, excuse me, at the Interstellar Hackathon at Starship Congress 2015. Okay. And youth, and by the way, I just want you to know that explaining all that after 14 hours of Starship Congress today, <laughs> man. Somebody owes me a Red Bull. <laughs> Thank you. If you ever come my way, Mike, I will get you a Red Bull. <laughs> so is, well, guys, I, he means that literally, by the way. That's a real bull. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got a red one out in the field. Red, right, James. Yeah, <laughs> Would you like that with vodka? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking, does he want to run from it or run behind it? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you again, Andreas. I've seen you too. Hey, so did you guys have any questions? Any, any further questions? Yeah, well, there, actually, we have, we have one question from uh, some guy named Patrick Festa. Who is this guy, Festa? Uh, <laughs> he says um, how, something. Of, he's, he asked, uh, oh "How gosh, long has there been a How long has there been a Starship Congress? Congress? 
This is yeah. the second Starship Congress. We've been, we, uh, Icarus Interstellar formed in 2009 and, and uh, really came, came together organizationally in 2011 after the very first DARPA sponsored 100 year Starship public symposium, public, public study symposium, then uh, worked together with the organization which took over 100 year Starship. And then uh, this sort of was a, a, a parting of ways. We wanted to go one way, they wanted to go another way. And, it, and by the way, it, it, it in fact relates to this idea that I call the Buckfield rule. And that is if some people want to work together and they think that's the way we should do things. And other people are like, I want to go and do stuff on my own. And Buckfield said to me some time ago that if you think the way to do it is to work together, then go and do it that way. And if you think the the way to do it is on your own, then go and do it that way. But do whichever way you want to pursue, and in this case, interstellar space exploration. However you do it, do it to the best of your ability. And that is a, a terrific, is what I call the Buckfield approach to interstellar space exploration. The field rule. <laughs> I'm unworthy. Yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is the second Starship Congress, and uh, we, this is the first interstellar hackathon. It's been... Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You have anything that this guy's worn out. Yeah, this I'm, guy, I'm this sure, guy. Sure like, you're saying it so well. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Like, yeah. yeah, we we were pretty. Uh, it, it was it was great to see people coming coming together and joining ideas. And uh, you know, you never know if it's working until you see it happening. And uh, you know, every now and then, there's you have a little crisis of faith. You know, you're you're wondering. Uh, is this a real thing? Are people really paying attention? And and I can say that that most of the attendees, if not all of the attendees of the Starship Congress, are new. They, they they're not really returning from the previous one, so it's a new population on the other end, you know, on the other corner of this country. And uh, you know, they're interested. They're interested. They're keen. Uh, they wanted to participate. They were really good sports, you know, during the during the conference when we had technical difficulties. You know, you can tell when a community is coming together and when they're when they're there for something more than the service. You can you can go to a high end uh, entertainment type uh, event, public entertainment does type it, event. And, you know, does it give and, you um, a reaffirmation of what you're doing? <laughs> Oh, a- absolutely. You know, it's, it's a uh, Andre says that there's that it's a different crowd than the first Starship Congress. But it, it, the, there's about there's a, I would say there's about 150 paid attendees. We have about 25 percent of them I've seen in other uh, interstellar or space related uh, conferences or, or or summits. And then uh, compared to the first Starship Congress, we have probably 400 percent more students. The That's great. Real- the, the amazing advantage of this of this uh, particular Starship Congress is that these these students who are future space professionals get to yeah. interact with working space professionals. And, what, and, go ahead. Sorry, that's what I wanted to ask you about the um, the age range. You know, the average age of people at the conference. At the uh, at in in the past, it has been older. This time, it is definitely younger. Uh, that's good. Go ahead. That's great. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's a and, the, and here's the other thing is the students are bringing. I mean, you should see the work that they are bringing to this conference, to this summit. It is, it is mind blowing that they're putting together this quality of scientific tra- uh, scientific of scientifically trained exercises of of uh, excuse me uh, of exercises of scientific practice. That's really the best way to put it. Exercises of scientific practice. Before you joined, I was talking about that in the uh, the initial presentation of uh, Evenstein and his uh, and his team uh, at Drexel with their uh, engineering was really astonishing for students. Yeah, it is. That, we, they had the they had the poster work up of the of uh, of three different uh, projects like you're talking about, Buck, and I was blown away. I, I couldn't even imagine being an undergraduate and developing work of this maturity. And it's, and it, it, the, the thing is it has lasting value. It will, it is definitely making contribution to the larger interstellar knowledge base, uh, excuse me, knowledge base of interstellar space science. 
And uh, that's Starship Congress 2013, excuse me, 2013 was terrific, but 2015 is just, it's, it's a factor more than the first one was. The first one was great. The first one was like, uh, this is our, we're learning something here. The second one is like, wow, we're contributing something. Here. Now, let me ask you, what are some of the, just sort of pick from what you heard today, what are some of the better ideas you heard today? You don't have to have a favorite. Just- yeah, we had a, at the hackathon. We had we had really good up on on things that we really needed solutions for. So there was there was some really hardcore like technical problems, like how do we communicate with Alpha Centauri? And there was some interesting, and there was you know that was good. That was, offered. that was like a forty. That was Robert Freeland came. They have a plan to communicate with Alpha Centauri. There's a forty kilometer tower on the moon. That's that's their plan. Or, it, or in orbit, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's that is cool. And um, there was that guy Nick Nielsen. Yeah, that that, <laughs> that guy, that strange guy. That, I keep hearing listen, about him. He's coming down, he was coming up with idea after idea after. Listen, idea. I was the, the, that first. table was yeah. by far. I, I mean, it, it, I don't have and the Nick way Nielsen to put it across probably. without sounding facetious. Their ideas were deeper and further and more developed than nearly everybody else at the Starship Congress. You, you, you take for granted that, that Nick Nielsen is on this podcast and he's, he's participating. That, that, please mark my words, Mike Mongo. Nick Nielsen is one of the brightest amongst us. <laughs> and delivering a keynote tomorrow. I can't wait. This is where you say, oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it I don't take like my button to, right now. <laughs> it looks like he's about to fall asleep. Now, now you're making him all nervous. You're gonna really deliver now. <laughs> I am about to fall asleep. I've been awake for a long time and didn't get much sleep last night. Oh. Well, I got. A, I was gonna say I got a couple of quick questions for Mike and everybody there. Uh, Paul kind of took one of mine, but first question is between the three of you: um, What do you think is the most viable thing that you heard today, and what are you looking forward to the most for tomorrow? Okay, and we're going to wrap it up on this note because we're, we're our energy level is down to like point yeah. one. Okay, so uh, most viable. I think the most viable thing was uh, the student representation um, and um, the, uh, the number of students that want to um, uh, explore the interstellar questions by self-organizing and, and spreading throughout oh, the universities. Yeah was totally spot on and there was such enthusiasm and vision with that um you know that was that was blowing us all away we, we, we're seeing yeah. the next generation yeah yeah there's no that's that's, that's right yeah with that was what's that guy's name damien damien churchy damien church wow by the way we're gonna have uh paul we will have the videos from starship congress 2015 interstellar hackathon up well i'll send you the link to damien's talk that rachel's Okay, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, it's uh, it, 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 I mean, this it's it's like I'm saying that we've been going at this 14 hours, and and it it's been so good that we're able to pull off this level of communication and enthusiasm. It was it is it's knockout. <laughs> Icarus Interstellar. Amen. Good job. Okay, so, well, thanks, guys. You can you can head to bed now. Okay, <laughs> good seeing you. Thanks for your time. Right. Good night, Mike. Good work. Uh, it's Rachel and uh, Andreas. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Okay, we're going to wrap up soon. Uh, any any more comments from you guys? Uh, questions for Nick or uh, Mike? You haven't said much tonight. You have any any comments? We have we have a question from Patrick, which I'm not sure we well. Let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, in pursuing ideas about ship design and propulsion, do you have a difficulty in separating the pseudoscience from the actual science? kind of talked about that a little bit but uh uh anytime you have you know if you if you go on the internet you'll find hundreds of really bad ideas for space propulsion (laughs) which are never going to fly uh but what do you guys think i've always read a big um I just wanted to mention, I, I saw an article on the internet just in the past few days of a fairly serious proposal 
to do away with the peer review in scientific journals, the argument being that it, slow, it slows down science and slows down the progress of knowledge. It's often biased. Why don't we just get rid of it, publish it, and the good stuff will float to the top like cream. And you could uh, apply that same model to uh, anything else. Uh, and, and yeah, there's a lot of garbage on the internet and there's a lot of great stuff on the internet. And uh, hopefully over time, the good stuff will rise to the top and the rest will be uh, uh, mercifully forgotten. Of course, yeah, but we... pon- pond scum floats too. Yeah, <laughs> and unsinkable rubber ducks. <laughs> there, there's already so many academic papers being published every day. It's impossible to read them all. If, we, if it starts, if the quality oh. of that's, that's what that's what that's what Brian Koberly told us. He can't read every paper in astrophysics. Right? Right. I mean, he, yeah, but I, I don't I don't think it's the answer is getting rid of peer review. I think part of the answer because a lot of studies are unwitting repetitions of things that have already been done before because the original results were unfavorable to the original hypothesis. I think that publishing unfavorable or negative results would probably benefit a lot also. I agree with that. You know, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that episode 23 quite a bit. We're talking about reproducibility. Uh, You know, some people will tell you the peer review system is broken in some fields, not in every field. Uh, But, um, you know, it it depends on whom you ask. Uh, There have been some recent, there was a recent scandal where people invented peer reviewers who weren't real. And, Mm -hmm. uh, but that's my wife has run into that. Yeah. Uh, and there's also uh, people who sort of form these circles where they peer review each other favorably. Uh, so, um, but I, I'm married to a peer reviewer, and she's rejected a few papers in her career. Uh, uh, and she Why? hates she hates doing that, but she's you know she feels bad about it, but she does it uh, mm-hmm. because she has wants to hold a high standard in her field. Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, what do you think, Nick? I don't think uh, that any one top-down plan is going to be realized just because of the diversity today of media outlets. Uh, so, you know, certainly the flagship scientific journals like Nature and Science are going to continue peer review, whatever else is said. Uh, but if if you want to get the word out, you have alternatives and. And uh, you'd better be on your guard, whether you're reaching, reading nature or science or one of my blog posts. <laughs> well, you know, has uh, anyone go has ahead. anyone here heard of uh, Paul Feyerabend? Yeah. yeah, yeah, philosopher. Yeah, philosopher of science. And what what he did was he was sort of um, uh, he was critical of this idea. He said that uh, you know science today, the way it was, well. You know, he was speaking years ago, but it's the same way. It's still uh, very formal and has these procedures and whatnot, like peer review. And he said, pick any example you like, any field or discipline of science you like. And I can show you how if uh, any rules you propose for distinguishing science from pseudoscience, if they're even handedly applied, I can show you instances where consistent application of those rules would have hurt the progress of science. And his basic thesis was that the only rules in scientific investigation should be there are no rules and anything goes. Well, mm, that uh, kind of gets into some ethical issues on that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, but, but there, is, there is a common misconception that there is something called a scientific method right, or the oh, yeah. scientific method. It, it, there are many scientific methods, and they depend on the field and the paradigm that that currently at a, has hold. The best catalog of those that I know of is this. Hmm. Systematicity. System systematicity. Uh, this guy Paul Paul Hoining. Well, no, he, he just made an enemy of that that kind of. Uh... <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> I, I just made an enemy. No, well, I mean, I, 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 I hate, I hate that kind of, uh, that kind of neologism. But anyway, go ahead. Oh, there, yes. there's a, there's a wonderful. He talks about that. 
He talks about how horrible it is because all his books have titles that are like unpronounceable and he cops to that. There's a wonderful exchange between Paul Feyerabend and Imri Lakatos, who was a philosopher. Oh, Lakatos. Philosopher. Yeah. Who, philosopher of science and philosopher of mathematics who often was very um, vehement in his opinions. And when people disagreed with him in arguments, he would tell, say that they should be taken out against a wall and shot. So he gives a, <laughs> some very, very good comebacks to, uh, to Feyerabend. They, they were friends, but they were also academic rivals who had very different uh, views, but were able to exchange them. And there's a wonderful book that's been published of some of their letters uh, back and forth over the years. What's it called? Uh, I, I can I can tell you later. I and, uh, and, oh, or I can type it into Google right now and see if I'm, I can. Yeah, uh, I'm furiously doing the same thing. Okay, well, we, we'll get it in the show notes, and you can read it tomorrow. Uh, I was I was actually reading it just before I came, left for the Starship Congress. I keep, keep it on my bedside table. So but, uh, I know that the the, uh, the trip from the West Coast to the East Coast is always uh, <laughs> a little bit tough on your brain. Uh, yeah. Oh wait! This is the book that uh, Lakatos died before, uh, yeah. before this book got published, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was published, yeah, and then Lockheed and then Feyerabend did against method. He yeah, that's his, basic, his side. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, let's see. Uh, anybody we have need any- to have a philosophy of science episode. Does anybody out there oh, have any other questions? I see Patrick. Uh, uh, okay, Patrick got, got all his questions, I think, in. Um, anybody else out there listening to the live stream? No? Okay. Well, the Q&A is still open, but we're going to close it pretty soon because uh, we're going to wrap up shortly. Uh, it actually has already been uh, an hour and... and Eight minutes. I'm oh, sorry, an hour and six minutes. Um, so uh, let's just. Uh, I haven't heard uh, Mike. Mike Bowler, you have any uh, comments or questions for any of these um, guys? Uh, not as such. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's it uh, Starship. Uh, you know uh, the whole Starship thing. It's. It, it's fa- it's interesting to me. It's fascinating. It's just that um, until we start doing stuff, right? I think that, that's, well, that's you're an I engineer. Think. I know you want to build stuff and test stuff. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I, I want to be this test pilot one of these days. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> oh, I'd but, love uh, to do that. I'm an engineer too. So I mean, i I want to see, yeah. I want to see a, at least a good, math model, if not a, yeah, if I not a. a, a, a if you two can build it, I'll fly it. <laughs> I don't think we can build it. <laughs> I mean, that was my dream when I was a kid was to build a starship. Uh, but I think my, my opinion has changed quite a bit about what kind of starship we should have. Um, I, yeah. I, I think, I think that the, the progress in, in other fields is going to outrun propulsion by a long way. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. As far yeah, as far as um, Starship, I mean, yeah, I'm kind of I'm I'm kind of in the boat of like I like to start seeing some real designs, some real testing on uh, concepts, uh, testing up you know, or proof of concept type uh, testing, and then then I'll, I'll probably start getting excited about it because uh, right. it sounds like we're really still in this. Yeah. You know, why are we going? Why well, we, we couldn't even right now. We can't even send one kilogram to Alpha Centauri. I. You know, yeah. far less is uh, a world ship. Yeah. So, well, uh, I was talking with uh, Stuart Robbins, and actually, I'll be talking to him some more tomorrow uh, about New Horizons and uh, kind of, you know, that that how that mission came together, and you know, uh, it's it, it, it's I, I, I I'm amazed NASA can get anything done, or or these. Well, you these know what? That, well, that was Alan Stern and his team at Southwest Research, plus. Uh, People at, at Johns Hopkins. Yeah, because yeah, because I think in one of his shows he was talking about how uh, the uh, to get they they needed to get that the, the probe to uh, Pluto within ten years. They needed so they when they started figuring everything out, they didn't have a rocket that they could orbit or put in orbit. So they had to do the, the flyby and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know, so 
you know, we're, I mean, we're barely, you know, we're barely able to get, you know, to, to accomplish these things. I mean, I, I know with Voyager and all the other uh, probes that have now starting to leave the, leave the solar system, you know, but those were on sl- slower trajectories and stuff like that. But uh, I think uh, until we can get, uh, you know, get the technology to get us moving faster, uh, quicker, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. You see, I, I, I saw James comment, by the way, if you see Stuart Robbins, uh, uh, good luck with his debate with Hoagland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm interviewing him tomorrow. Yeah. Hoagland is a master at rhetorical, uh, flummery. He will, yeah. he's a master <laughs> or something. <laughs> bullshit. I mean, what? Well, yeah, bullshit is actually a uh, better term, uh, <laughs> but he's very good at, at, uh, covering up his errors. Uh, yeah. And the gish gallop. Yeah, it's like the Gish Gallop, exactly. Yeah. I, He's, I, I kind of wish he would. I would like do to it. talk to him. Hmm. Yeah, no, I was just going to say. Kind of I, I kind of wish he. Yeah, because uh, I, I I don't see having you know. Well, I'm I'm of the opinion that if you debate the pseudoscientists, the religious, all you're doing is uh, you know uh, acknowledging that their point may be valid, and um. That's where, you know, I, that's where I have, I have a problem. I mean, if it was, uh, you know, a debate, um, oh, I, I don't know, but something a little bit closer to the same, you know, do we, do we, uh, try for interstellar travel or versus, uh, in, or interstellar or uh, within the solar system travel, you know, I, I'd like to, you know, that, that bait is fine and dandy. But when you start set, you know, giving Hoagland a platform to say, to, to spout his stuff on an equal footing as real science, I really have, I have a lot of issues with that. Yeah. I, well, the, the thing about this debate though, is that it's actually in Hoagland's playground. It's on his show. Yeah. Well, so I that the, may actually give some of the people who listen to his, um, yeah, there's, talk, I, 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 well, he can edit that too, right? I mean, well, that's well, it's the thing. supposed to be live. Oh, it was Isn't live? It? Uh, yeah. That'd be good. It was, yeah. it was like, you know, there was a lot of controversy and Bill Nye uh, debated Ken Ham, right? I mean, right. And there's still I, controversy yeah. about that. Yeah. Because Ken uh, Ham's views are not legitimate science. Yeah. But well, the thing is, if, if Stuart but says Ham no and walks better, away from it. Sorry. Uh, Ham had better grounding for his fundamental perspective than Bill Nye did. In terms of Bill Nye was not clear on the scientific perspective from which his results were obtained, where Ham was very clear about, here's my foundation. I These are my assumptions that Genesis is true. It's literally true. And he could state that super clearly, which Nye could not. Nye had great um, presence in terms of presenting reasoning, but on a foundational basis, he was less secure than Ham, who was very upfront, I'm basing all of my uh, derived reasoning on this ancient mythology. Uh, okay, you didn't say that. I'm adding that. But um, but he was super clear on it. And so everything had to be consistent with this paradigm that he was in. And he could state what the paradigm was very clearly. Science is a lot more difficult to do. Yeah, it's a lot more complex and a lot more nuanced, and uh, that's that's the 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 what the, that's the uh, ground that we're standing on. But yeah, it, but it works. I mean, uh, you it's easy to point out about thirty things that Ken Ham could not predict with his views, and uh, only thirty. Well, <laughs> th- thirty off the top of my head, I can, not being a biologist. <laughs> <laughs> and Nye, Nye did a good job of doing that. But these are these are things that are equivalent to uh, physicists and others saying, well, this is unknown. We're not sure about this about the Big Bang, or we're not sure about that about uh, these constants, why they have these things that we do. We can't explain why... Um, I mean, the, to me, the idea of many worlds, multiverses, where in deep in the quantum foam, I am Captain America. To me, that's a very unlikely proposition. Well, but I mean, 
Yeah, the answer is we don't know, and that's just reality. That we don't know. I'm pretty sure that in another universe, I am not Captain America. Pretty confident on that one. Well, uh, I'm sure of that yeah. too. By the way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Flash! Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, but J- James is Flash in another universe. Well, let's All not right. turn this into a comic book but, podcast. Okay, yeah. I tell you what, but folks. No, uh, uh, I'm going to go around. One of the things. Yeah, go ahead. Go real ahead, James. quick was that. Uh, Problem is when a scientist gets an invite to a debate from a pseudoscientist, if they don't accept, the pseudoscientist will automatically throw out whether well, they're too scared to talk to me about it. They're yeah. too scared to debate. Yeah. That's right. You can't win either way. The best thing you can do is go out there and make the most valid points, try to discuss their, try to show the flaw in their logic, and try not to allow flaws to appear in yours. You mm, can't true. win either way, but you may as well go out there and have some fun doing it. Okay. Uh, one question I want to throw out to the panel. Uh, has, I haven't seen it. Has any of you seen the Key and Peel uh, parody of uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson? I've got it queued up waiting to watch. Okay, I'll have to watch it after this. I'll be tired. Can you post a link? Yeah. Uh, it's all over the internet. But uh, yeah. uh, David, Grin- David Grinspoon just put on uh, Facebook, this is frickin' brilliant. Key and Peel do Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are pretty good. Yeah. If so, it's any, uh, if it's if it's anything like the Obama translator, I think you'd be uh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I love that. Okay, love well, that. I'll put a link up on the show notes for sure. Uh, um, and the show notes will be out in, you know, probably by breakfast time here in the U.S. Um, anyway, uh, let me wrap up shortly. I want to say a little bit about uh, some of the future stuff we have coming up. And uh, so before we do that, let's go around. Anybody want to say, get a last word in? Uh, Adam. I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. It's been absolutely awesome. I'd like to thank Nick in particular for his input. It was great to uh, have Mike, Rachel, and Andreas join us. It's been awesome. I would like to give one quick shout out to Brent Folin and his colleagues that have observed the cosmic neutrino background. They've finally found it. And that is awesome. Can you send me a link for that? Because I'd like to put it in the show notes. Wow, that's sure, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Uh Buck, any last uh, thought? Nope. Just that I think we should do a uh, a straight up philosophy of science. Uh, demarcation between pseudoscience and legitimate science uh, podcast. I've been wanting to do that on the Wow Signal for months, but I haven't found the right the right expert. Uh, um, well, of course, Neil, I, of course I want I want I want Dan Danette, but I, I can't seem to get a hold of him. Uh, I, I know I know one guy whose name I'll send you is is really up on some of the latest advances. Yeah, the whole demarcation problem. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, I've always been interested in it because. Uh, I think something, you know, there are rare exceptions to pseudoscience that may turn out to be proto-science, but uh, James? Uh, This has been pretty interesting. I'm always fascinated by anything to do with interstellar travel, and it was good to see everybody again, and I had a lot of fun. Yeah, Um, and uh, we may be seeing you again soon uh, on Monday. (laughs) Uh, we're doing it. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, let's see. And uh, Mike Bowler. Uh, no final comments, but uh, definitely, I know uh, you've you've been you've put out a uh, announcement about uh, you know doing pod you know uh, assisting the the podcast doing. Uh, uh, extra blog work. So if, if there's anybody interested in, uh, you know, if they want to talk to anybody who does a podcast, I'm more than happy to help you out. Uh, you know, if you have any questions about what software to use, hardware, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm, I certainly will make myself available to answer. Yeah, your I'm looking to train up some co-producers, but, uh, I'll, I'll leave that for another time. Uh, finally, uh, Nick, I think it's probably uh three o'clock in the morning, your time. So, uh, <laughs> One last uh, comment local, before you wink out. Local time here is 11.35 p.m. Uh, I'd just uh, like to mention that the book I had uh, mentioned earlier is titled 
for and against method, including Lakatos's lectures on scientific method and the Lakatos Feuerabend correspondence. Uh, so, um, well, on that, uh, thank okay. you oh, for right. the opportunity to be unseen past again. And uh, thanks for being a reporter easy. from Philadelphia. And uh, mm -hmm. we'll, uh, okay, now uh, just a couple of things uh, coming up. We're going to do a special. Uh, because it's going to be Labor Day Monday, I'm going to do a special edition. Uh, the The time has been set to bring in people from uh, time zones other than the U.S. So uh, we are going to have three new, three new. Uh, well, we hope we'd have three new panelists on the show Monday. That will be episode 23, and we're going to be talking about uh, scientific reproducibility and the problems in science, particularly in biomedical science, but, um, and we'll have, uh, some folks from India on the panel, uh, who've been contributing very nicely to our discussions on Google plus we have, uh, coming up, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, on episode 27, we will be talking again about Mars one and we'll let the proponents have their say. Uh, we'll also ask them some questions. So if you have questions for people who are Mars One candidates who've actually been through, I think, three levels of selection so far, uh, get them to us. You can email them to unseenpodcast at gmail.com. We'll try to get them to the uh, to the candidates. We I can't promise that because we often end up not getting to all our questions, but we'll try. Uh, episode 26 is going to be our meta episode. and. We will, on that one, we're going to talk about the first six months of the podcast, what we've achieved, what we haven't achieved, where we'd like to go from there, and so on and so forth. Kind of a, a group group about uh, where you'd like to get the, uh, uh, where we'd like to go, how we'd like to improve, how we'd like to find our audience. Uh, right now, we're averaging about 200 downloads per episode. We'd like that to be more like, well, a lot higher. Uh, and if you're one of those people who are downloading us, we'd like to hear from you and know what you like and don't like about the podcast before we do that one. So that'll be at the end of September. Uh, at the end of October, October 30th, we're going to do an episode on cryptid. That'll be fun. You know, we're going to go squatching, uh, <laughs> uh, virtually squatching, and uh, it'll be fun. Uh, yeah, we're going to make fun of people. I, I, I can't. I'm not. I'm not going to lie to you. We're, we're going to show lots of disrespect. Uh, <laughs> but I'll do it with my normal class and demeanor. But but if you are pro-cryptid, if you're a person who thinks that Bigfoot is real, uh, or any of these other critters, uh, Chupacabra, whatever, we'd like to hear from you. <laughs> I, pr I promise we will, we will treat oh, you with, with a modicum of respect. Uh, and you might even have you on the show. So... Um, oh, I don't think I'll be able to muster that level of respect. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's lots of species of beetle that we haven't found. Um, anyway, uh, if you're a, if you're a, uh, a beetle cryptozoologist, you're probably going to be successful. <laughs> uh, and finally, um, there are three dates that we will not have. Be recording every November twenty seventh, uh, December twenty fifth, and January first. So, so uh, don't be surprised if nothing comes out those days or the day after that. Uh, so I'd like to thank our panel: Adam Synergy Smith, Buckfield, James Garrison, Mike Bowler, Nick Nielsen, also Mike Mongo, and his friends from Starship Congress. Uh, go to unseenpodcast.com to learn more about this podcast or the other episodes, uh, our panelist, Mateusz Machis, I think I pronounced that sort of right, has put together a nice uh, page that lists all the episodes so you can, with the links that so you can download or, or view the blog page. Uh, and uh, you can also, if you have any questions, comments, criticism, anything, please, uh, you can go on to our subreddit or you can go you can just email them to, to unseenpodcast at gmail.com. We read everything we get, and 
we like to read it on the air. In fact, uh, if if you give us a uh, sufficiently uh, well thought out uh, email, we will read it on the air with your permission. So uh, we'll see you next. We'll see you actually in a few days on episode twenty three. And this has been the Unseen Podcast, episode twenty two. It's the fourth of September, two thousand fifteen, and goodbye.